morning and welcome to Sister in Church. My name is Sammy Ramos. I'm the lead pastor. I'm so glad you're here to worship with us today. We have uh, some great songs to sing as our band leads us in worship. We're continuing our study through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, that's where our sermon will be out for the day. And then we're going to have a time of response at the end of our service to give you an opportunity to continue uh, whatever conversation God starts in your heart. We believe that our God is living and active and very, very relational. And so um, if you have never sensed that in your walk with God, in your journey, either through this life or your journey uh, in, in, in your religious life, uh, know that our God is so much more um, concerned with your relational standing with him than he is your religious performance. We at Cistern Church believe uh, just that idea in the idea of being a cistern. Um, the, a cistern is similar to a well. You go to a cistern for water, but the difference between a cistern and a well is that the cistern doesn't produce its own water. A cistern's received that water from someplace else. There's some other source, whether it be rains or overflow. Uh, there's another source providing water for a cistern. We believe that source for a believer, for cistern church, and for every single person who's ever called themselves a Christian, that source of life and hope and love in this world is God himself through Jesus. He's given us so much grace. He's given us so much love. And just like a cistern, we've received so much from God. We're called to open our lives up, to share what God has given to us. And so um, I hope that this morning we that we as a church would open our lives up, that we would share whatever God placed on our heart, and, and that you, if this is your first time visiting with us, or even if you're, you've been with us for some time, that you would receive uh, that same grace and love that God has shown to us all. Let me pray for us, and we'll get started. God, we thank you. We thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ who have been faithful um, to be there, to be present, to be available to uh, each other during this season. We, we thank you that um, you have called not just uh, us as individuals, but you've called us into community. You've called us into a relationship uh, with you, God, but with each other and that in serving the church and being available, we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. God, I pray that in this time, um, this Sunday morning, even though we're separated and in different homes, that, that you would continue um, building up your church. God, that we would be united in focus and in purpose of seeing the gospel of Jesus um, grow not only in our lives, but it would spread into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, into our schools, every place that we go. God, we pray that we're a light giving off um, just the radiance of Jesus in all that we do. We love you. We praise you. And we pray for your spirit to move during this time. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Deserve your grace on top of grace. More than I've asked for, and more than I'm worth your grace on top of grace. How sweet a sound once lost, now found. Heaven came down, and grace rescued me. And hallelujah. my sin and penalty and at the cross you took my place with your grace on top of grace lord how you love me and i don't deserve your grace on top of grace more than I've asked for and more than I'm worth your grace on top of grace how sweet a sound once lost now found heaven 
came down and grace rescued me and hallelujah I am free from my sin and penalty and at the cross you took my place with your grace on top of grace with your grace on top of grace
hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Good morning again. We are continuing our study through the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 13. We finished chapter 12 last week, and so we're picking up 13.1 today. If you want to go ahead and turn there to your Bibles, uh, feel free to do that. During this, uh, during this pandemic, during this COVID season, me and Beth have taken on some projects. This shed that I'm preaching this sermon into a camera is one of those projects. Not that we wanted a studio, uh, but we just need a little extra space in our house to work privately in, uh, quietly in, More is more accurate. And so that's one of our projects. Another project that we wanted to tackle since we very first moved into this house is this deck on the side of our house. There's a, a deck. I have no idea how old it is. It's probably close to 30 years old. Um, at least it looks that way. It might be younger and we've just done a terrible job of maintaining it. Uh, we haven't power washed it or stained it since we've moved in. That's some six years. And that's probably why it's in the state of disrepair that it is now. And so we had a landscaper come over to the house this last week uh, and get his thoughts. We just wanted to get some ideas for what we can do with this space. We don't want a deck. Uh, we, we don't want to have to maintain. As I said, we, we haven't treated this one very well. We don't want to simply just replace it with another deck that I'm not going to maintain. Um, as well either. And so um, as I'm describing the deck to our landscaper, I, I think he hears some of my um, some of the negative energy, I guess, that I'm putting out there towards this deck. It's it hadn't I haven't done anything like uh, fall down or, or twist my ankle or anything on it, but it's possible because uh, it's in that bad of a shape. And as I'm describing it, uh, he says something that's really stuck with me. It's stuck with me this week as I'm preparing for the sermon, but it's really just stuck with me in a lot of ways. Uh, he said it's served its purpose and now it's time for something new. It's served its purpose. See, at one time somebody had this deck built or someone built it themselves. Someone had a plan and a purpose and they designed this thing and they built it and they loved it. They enjoyed it. This deck at one point in somebody's life added value, not only to the house, but value to the quality of life of the person that had it. It, it was something that was beautiful to somebody, not to me. Um, but someone really enjoyed this deck but it's served its purpose. It no longer has purpose. And for that reason, it's got to go. It's got to make way for something new. And so here in Mark chapter 13, Jesus um, leaves the temple. He leaves the temple for the last time in this earthly life. And he d describes to his disciples just this idea of something serving its purpose and making way for something new. So let's read uh, together what the word of the Lord says in Mark chapter 13. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to them, do you see these great buildings? 
there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, this is outside the city, opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. Be on your guard for they will deliver you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you were to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death and father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. But you and you, will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a very sobering um, truth to our daily lives. God, we, we pray that your spirit would lead us in this time. God, that you would open our minds and hearts to receive what it is you have for us through this passage. We ask that, that your, your spirit work and use me, God, to, to draw people closer to you. We pray that each of us would, would be um, more devoted to, to the one God, the one true God who is worthy of all that we have, of all that we are. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's one thing right from the very top of this passage. Um, I think we, we need to pay attention to, to verse 1 and 2. Uh, it's a simple passage that just describes Jesus walking out of the temple. Uh, but I think it sets up Jesus's conversation through the rest of this entire chapter, really. And so Jesus, this is verse one and two, and he's, he came out of the temple. One of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and wonderful buildings. He's talking about the temple. The temple was impressive. They had, there were stones that were 10 meters tall, but by, by 40 meters why? They say that the columns in the front of the temple were all, where they were each carved out of singular stone. They weren't bricks stacked on top of them. They were just one stone columns measuring 40 to 50 meters high. The, the temple itself in Jerusalem was a sight to behold. It was a marvel. It was an engineering marvel. And they were right to marvel at these buildings, but Jesus sees them marveling and he tells them, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Jesus says, you see these buildings, they're cool and all, but don't get so attached to buildings that you place your personal happiness, your own personal uh, enjoyment of life. Don't attach your identity to things like buildings in this world. You see, in all of Scripture, in, in all of the Bible, in all of God's dealings with man, there, there's this, there's this theme about God's dwelling place. Where does God live? Where does he dwell? We know that he, he's omnipresent. He is everywhere. But, but because of the way God has presented himself to his people, there's this idea that there's a dwelling place for God. And, and this is enforced by the building of the tabernacle with Moses, that the tabernacle was the dwelling place of God with man. 
was in the tabernacle. Then it was the temple built by Solomon. And now this temple, this was the second temple that Jesus was in, in Jerusalem. And it was a holy place. There was a holy of holies where the the presence of God lived. And there's a thick veil separating the holy of holies where the presence of God dwelt from everybody else. This temple was the dwelling, as far as the the ancient world concerned, as far as the people are concerned, as far as our understanding of the Old Testament, this temple was the dwelling place of God with man in Jesus, who is the embodiment of the presence of God. He himself is God made flesh. On this Tuesday, the presence of God leaves the temple for the very last time. Remember, this is Holy Week. Jesus would be crucified on Friday. And on Tuesday night, Jesus leaves the temple to never visit it again. And so when Jesus leaves, when he exits the temple on Tuesday night with his disciples, it is equivalent to the very presence of God leaving the temple for the very last time. So I think that's why Mark And really all the gospel narratives notate this one moment of Jesus, the embodiment of the presence of God, leaving the dwelling place of God because the temple itself, it served its purpose. It was no longer useful for what it was originally purposed for. See, the temple is where the sacrificial atonement system took place. It's where man was reconciled with God. It was the place where people brought their sacrifices. The sacrifice was performed in front of crowds. And then the priests would go into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for on behalf of the people. It was the place where sinful man was reconciled to a holy God. And as Jesus leaves the temple, he declares This is no longer the dwelling place of God. This is no longer the temple as it was originally purposed for. It's just a building. The presence of God has left this heap of stones, has served its purpose. It's an amazing moment. It's just you think about Jesus leaving this building Later on that night, as Jesus and his disciples are sitting on top of the Mount of Olives, they're they're overlooking the Temple Mount. They can see the temple where they are. And as they see the temple glowing with fires all about the city, as, as so many people are gathered there for Passover, for the celebration, for this feast, the the disciples are taking in the beauty of a torch lit or fire lit city. Hey, Jesus, what did you mean by that? Tell us again. It was Peter, James, John, and Andrew gathered around Jesus, and they said, tell us, teacher. They asked him privately in verse 4, tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? What do you mean all these buildings are good? Tell us more about this, Jesus. So Jesus obliges. In verse five, Jesus begins to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. He's telling them not just about the temple fulfilling its purpose of serving and and coming to an end of usefulness. But I believe Jesus is now talking about all of creation. Again, if you look at the narrative of scripture, the end of the story doesn't end with some utopia brought about by Christianity finally conquering over every other world religion and bringing about world peace and a utopia that, that we all live in and that this is somehow considered a new earth. No, scripture talks about the end of this era of this earth eventually fulfilling its purpose and giving way to a new heaven and a new earth. And so Jesus says, these are the signs that creation is being reborn. People will come in my name. They'll be false teachers. There'll be people saying that they are Jesus, that they're Messiah, the Messiah. Not only will they say that they're Jesus, but they also offer false gospels. 
This is not just religious people taking the word of God and distorting it for their own purposes. But I believe it's anyone who says, hey, this is the way, this is the answer. Be that some philosophy or some religion or anti-religion or some dogmatic belief in the sciences or, or even atheism, whatever it is, anything that says this is the way to live, this is the way to be human apart from God, apart from Jesus, apart from his teachings, Jesus says, don't believe them at all. And many will come and they're going to deceive many. There's going to be crowds. There's going to be multitudes that follow them. Jesus says, don't you follow them as well. Don't be deceived. And he also talks about that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, but don't be alarmed. There's going to be famines and earthquakes. Don't be alarmed. Jesus says that all of these things are, are just the symptoms of this age coming to an end. What's the logical conclusion of sin? Other than destruction. Other than death. And she said we shouldn't be surprised that even creation itself struggles under the stress of the brokenness of this world, the, the even earthquakes and famines, and dare I add in that mix, pandemics. All of these things, Jesus says, are but the beginning of the birth pains. A friend uh, earlier this week posted a, um, I'm just, I'll just be honest, what I thought was an unflattering picture of his wife, who is uh, seven or eight months pregnant, um, and while I didn't think it was a very flattering picture, his caption for that picture was, she's so beautiful. It's hard to argue with that, right? And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful picture of, of a woman who is pregnant because there's hope. There's new life. There, there, there's something to expect. But how tragic would it be for someone to remain perpetually pregnant? For that to be someone's normal, for to be in a state where, where they're constantly expecting, but never to receive what their heart longs for. It would be tragic. And I, I, I would say that, that, that for no, having three kids myself and, and just having uh, in my own Facebook feed a memory pop up of a little two-year-old, almost three-year-old Ben and my wife standing outside of Memorial Hermann with, with, with her own belly popping out a little bit, getting ready for October or August 16th. It's Leah's birthday. That's today. Uh, happy birthday, Leah. But even seeing that picture just reminded me, and I thought that same thing. It is so beautiful. My wife is so beautiful, pregnant. But anyone who's gone through that process, I have not. And so I'm only just delivering this message via hearsay and witnessing other people go through it. It's painful. It hurts even with meds. There are real birth pains to bring about new life. And that's what Jesus is saying. At some point, this world, everything that you and me know and experience, what we see and taste and touch and feel and smell, all our five senses, all of it is going to come to an end. It's going to give birth to a new heaven and a new earth, and it's going to change. It's going to be stressful, any type of change, whether it's a new job or a, 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 a new child coming into it, moving. Any change in this life is considered by, by health professions is the most stressful times in life. And Jesus says, whenever you see the earth and the nation stressed, and seeming to crumble under change. Just know that God is birthing something new. These are just but the beginnings of birth pains. We should take solace in what Jesus says here. To know that Jesus not only saw it coming, but he warns us. And even the most chaotic of circumstances 
but a reminder that he is sovereign and good and in control of all things. The last thing Jesus tells his disciples is a warning. He says, be on your guard. for They're going to deliver you. Disciples, people who follow Jesus, people who claim to be Christians, to be little Christ's. They'll deliver you over to councils. You'll be beaten in synagogues. You'll stand before governors and kings for my sake, and we will bear witness before them. And he goes on to describe the persecution that Christians will face. The disciples faced this. Those four that are sitting around Jesus faced these persecutions. The church throughout every age and every era has faced persecution. They've been beaten for their beliefs that Jesus is the one true God. And in corners of our world today, there are people facing these things who are being imprisoned, who are speaking to rulers and authorities, arguing, fighting for their beliefs. And as I look at our own political landscape in the United States and I look at at just the trajectory that we're on and what is considered good and right and true, it does make me wonder at what point in our own history, in our own story, will the things that we teach as God's word, at what point will they be seen as unlawful, as evil, is unjust simply because it's faithful to God's word. I'm not saying all this to, to, to rile us all up and, and say, hey, we need to, to fight and we need to, to vote. Definitely do those things. I think all, every believer should. We should speak out. We should fight for our religious freedoms. I, I believe in all that, but I'm bringing all this up to, to encourage you to lean into the sovereignty of God, to trust God at his word, that Jesus, he's giving them these warnings. He's not saying that all of life is going to be like this. Jesus, even in the, the, the week he's going to be crucified, he's going to suffer more than anyone has ever suffered in this life. He, remember, he's sitting around a fire telling his disciples, enjoying their company. There's a lot of good stuff along the way. It's not all doom and gloom, but Jesus is kind enough to warn us of what may come our way. Jesus says to his disciples, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. I pray that that's me and you. I pray that that we're able to trust God when everything around us is falling apart. Jesus says when our world itself is crumbling, let that serve as just even greater proof that I am who I said I am. I'm going to do the things I said I'd do. And even when this world seems to be caving in on itself and everything is changing, Jesus says, trust me. Those are just the birth pains and something far greater. So unbelievably awesome that no, no, no ear, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard. No mind has even conceived of the goodness that Jesus has in store for his children, for those who endure to the end. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your great love for us, the church, Jesus, that you're willing to tell us beforehand. Things are going to get dark. Things may look grim, but that you're always going to be with us. That even in the midst of our most stressful trials, that your Holy Spirit will be there to comfort us and teach us and even tell us what to say. God, help us to to be in awe of what you're doing in our world today. God, let us look at all that is happening and just take comfort in knowing that you are sovereign and Lord over all things. And even in the midst of a pandemic, 
that you are bringing about your will and your purposes, not only for this world, but for the world to come. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to enter in a time of response. Our band's going to lead us in a song of worship as they do. If you want to join in and sing along, feel free to do that. But I also just want to throw this out there as an option. Um, we just spend some time praying. Uh, just pray for, um, pray for our country. Pray for our leaders. We're in, in an election year. Um, and it's always uh, so tense during this time. Uh, I really wish it wasn't. Um, I really wish there was more cordial communication and debate and discussion. But even in this season, just be praying for our leaders, uh, be praying for uh, God's glory and God's will to be brought about. And uh, uh, also, um, maybe even before that, would you just take a moment and just ask God to speak? Um, if you don't quite feel like like singing or joining in right away, maybe it's because God wants to continue the conversation with you. And so would you just make yourself available to whatever God has to speak to you in this moment? Um, let's worship together. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, and I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, and I believe you are the way, the truth, the light, I believe you are the way. had a good morning uh, worshiping and celebrating with us today. Um, I believe every Sunday morning is not only a celebration of everything that God has done for us through Jesus, but it's also an eager expectation of um, seeing Jesus, whether that's through his word and through the songs that we sing or uh, Lord willing someday soon, uh, Jesus coming again. And so um, I hope you've had a great morning. I hope that you're able to see Jesus more clearly through our time together. Um, just a couple of announcements. If you're a guest with Cistern Church and want to uh, learn more 
Uh, we want to we want to get to know you as well, so you can fill out a connect form. Uh, there's a digital connect form in the video description uh, that can be found um, either as a link that says connect uh, on the web page, or if you're on YouTube or Facebook, that link is in the video description. If you're a member of Sister in Church and want to just update us on what's going on in life, what's happening with you, uh, feel free to uh, use that not only for updates, but if you have any prayer requests, if we can be praying for you in your family in any specific ways. We definitely want to um, pray for you. So you can use that connect card as well. You can give to the mission of Sister and Church by uh, clicking the give link that's also in the video description or in the corner of the website. Uh, we look forward to meeting in person sometime soon. Uh, be on the lookout for any news, for any gatherings we may be having, um, maybe not for Sunday morning, but maybe just some auxiliary things, maybe in uh, front yards or parks in the area. So um, so we're looking to a cooler fall season, and uh, hopefully with that we'll be able to uh, uh, get together sometime soon. Uh, let's stand as I speak this benediction over you. Um, this is uh, just a time to receive a good word. And so let's, uh, let's stand with our, our palms facing upward, just in a posture of receiving. Let me speak this over you. Your God has loved you. He's loved you even more than his own earthly life. He's willing to give all so that you can become an adopted child of the King. As you go throughout your week, so you look at all the stress in this life and in this world. May you always be reminded that your heavenly father is in control and he's Lord over all things. You're loved. May you go in peace. Have a great week. Mm-hmm.